Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE here in New York City. This is our CUBE studio on the East Coast at the NYSE New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. This is where we're going to bring all the wall-to-wall -wall coverage here on Wall Street, connecting with our Palo Alto studio, bridging both Silicon Valley and Wall Street, where all the innovation's happening. We're going to do deep dives. We're going to explore what's going on in the New York scene and on the East Coast. This is our East Coast access point, and Isabel's here on theCUBE from CRO at Dun & Bradstreet. gets all the strategy at Dun & Bradstreet. Isabel, great to see you. I saw you at the IBM event. Thank you. It's um, great to see you again. Um, Amazing. I was really energized by the conversation I had with you and your team at Dun & Bradstreet because I just, my mind exploded and just was like, okay, you're sitting on so much data about business. <laughs> yes. Um, that's been the business model. Yes. Um, and now with Generative AI, you're seeing all these kind of new abstractions of innovation where software can come in and then take all that hard work yeah. and all that asset yes. and yeah. transform it into business value. And this is what everyone's talking about. All the big companies, hey, transform your business data into business value. Well, actually you have it and this is where um, companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, mm. Jamie Dimon's company, they got sitting on all this day. We just wrote a post on Silicon Angle about it. This is really where the action is. Yes, and you know, you you said it right, right? We're sitting in a gold mine, and I don't just let me just give you some context about DMB, right? We've been around for 180 years, believe it or not, and we are one of the largest uh, business information companies. Uh, serving uh, over 190,000 customers globally from very large household names all the way to SMB across every single vertical and customer. Think about banks are using us, insurance companies, uh, energy companies, corporates, public sector governments for multiple use cases. We're engaging with CIOs, CDOs, we're engaging with the sales and marketing professionals all the way to third party risk across the entire value chain because the multiple use cases that we serve is yeah. just unbelievable. And at the heart of what we have, of what we do, we have what we call the dance numbers, which is a business identifier. Yeah. And we provide 585 million information on private company data. Just imagine 585 million. Yeah. With business identifiers are unique that helps you to, to understand, you know, what are the different relationships and, and around that business, like hierarchies, ultimate beneficial ownership, uh, ownership ESG uh, characteristics of that, yeah. filmographic, you name it. So the use cases are expanding and the conversations were going into adjacent markets that we never thought we could play. So as you sit in the um the, the, the brain trust over at Dun & Bradstreet, clearly the Dun's number, everyone knows that. It's been a legacy product for all businesses, we know that. Uh, it's been a unique identifier, it's also been kind of a, a quality, of sign of quality. Okay, all that's great. But the opportunity where this goes is interesting because now we're in a connected world Correct. where data is now the, the currency for value creation and extraction and also service. Yes. So, and, and more data is coming in. So you're starting to see, I just interviewed a startup but yes. before you came on here, that are doing things around authorization, which solves a database problem where you have all these different fields, not to over complicate it, but you know, data is complicated. Yes. Okay, you, you guys know this, you're in that business. Yes. So how do you look at the problem, scope the, scope the challenge, yes. and then scope the opportunity of look. how to take all that data and slice and dice and slice the salami, as Dave Vellante says, all kinds of opportunities, now all done can be done generatively. Yeah, well, I think Gen AI only works if you have trusted and verifiable data. So a lot of people say, is it an LNM problem? No, it's a data problem. So you need to have trusted and verifiable data that you have the right to use in order to train the models and get the outcome that you want. Um, as you said, we're sitting in you know, a huge amount of data. And what I see is many customers, a number of trends that I see customers yeah. talking to us. One, they want to be able to get access to their data third party data and first party data, be able to match it and be able to have a holistic view of their customers, suppliers, yeah. vendors, right? Across the entire organization and to be used across every, every single function. And that's one of the major changes, right? Is how can I get access as a customer in an easy way? And how can I yeah. interact with the data in an easy way, faster, right? Without any friction. That's number one, AI help us if you have the right data. Number two, what we see is with AI is putting the highlight and the spotlight on 
the data state of, the, of, the, of every single company. They are in silos, some on prem, some on the cloud, in independent you know, uh, solutions yeah. and software that they don't talk to each yeah. other. We go and help customers with our dance to start matching and making sense of that data. And then third, we see as an emerging thing, customers wanted to have transparency of the supplier chain. Yep. And again, having those dance and having understanding who do you want to onboard becomes really, really important. Finally, the rise of private markets. Yep. Everybody wants information about private company information, yep. right? Where are the financials? What is the ultimate beneficial yeah. ownership? And we've been working very strategically with a number of technology providers yeah. as yeah. well as capital markets to really help our customers with those new generation of problems. Well, we're here in the big capital market, this epicenter here at NYSE of which you guys are a listed company. Congratulations, yeah. glad to see that. Nice plug there. Um, but I think you nailed a couple of things. One, I like that private company capital markets thing because you know, AI will actually be an agent for the business, whether they need financing, oh, you might want to do this kind of financing, or there's all kinds of services that can go bi-directional. So that's that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge right now I'd love to get your thoughts on is the product side, because I can imagine that your business customers can see a lot more headroom that was only reserved for big IT departments and consumer companies. So if I'm a business, I'm a, say I'm a commercial bank, I'm not the big banks on the mm -hmm. consumer side, I might want to have all that goodness uh -huh. that the big banks on the consumer side, credit yeah. card companies, all the big consumer, I mean, they spent billions of dollars on IT. Yes, yes. Now they could get the benefits of that scale. Yes. I'm sure this is kind of going on in your world. Yeah. Take us through the opportunities that you can see around the corner that's emerging because I can see the bridge to the future with this, with you guys. Okay, get me some good data, thank you very much. Yes. Good, good private market, capital markets, great, thank you very much. But I think there's a bigger piece. There's a bigger piece uh, ahead of us, and what we see is our customers, we start working with them on a specific use case in finance, and all the signs say, hang on a minute, but I can use the same underlying data now from credit risk perspective, and now I can use this underlying data to understand my suppliers and my customer and had a 360 view of risk of that supplier, vendor, partner, customer. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it opens opportunities for who can I sell to, who should I be selling to, who can I extend credit to, who should I be doing business with. It opens the aperture to a yeah. wider range of conversations and help our customers to yeah. solve both growth yeah but also mitigate risk. Yeah, I think the applications too on the customer side gets smarter as you get bring in the data, because you're bringing in trusted data. Correct. The key word is trust. So there's two concepts that are hot right now in tech I want to get your reaction yes. to. Yes. Trust and delegation. Because mm. like, if you're working with people and I delegate a task, <laughs> I hope it gets done properly. So yes. these become two words, not just automation, because automation is happening, we see automation but trust and delegation are two big topics that used to be reserved for kind of like in the weeds. But now it's like parameters that have, have to have strong opinions mm -hmm. about what something does because with Gen AI, you can't have to zero tolerance for failure. Yeah. Hallucinations, mm -hmm. drift, there's cybersecurity challenges. It's so funny, I was talking to <laughs> uh, the CDO Institute in New York a couple of weeks ago and um, they, I was talking to the CEO of an uh, AI company, and I said, what is the biggest problem you have? And he said, Isabel, we're running out of data, and we need more trusted data to learn from. So back to the So trust. They're, they're in training mode. They are in training mode. But said, we, there's lots of, and I said, <laughs> really? There are trillions and trillions of data in the open web? Yeah. But the question is, can it be trusted? Yeah. Do I have the right to use it? And can, it, can it be verified? And yeah. that's the key, it's at the core of the conversation. You know, that's a great thing um, brought up. I saw an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that the term was data inbreeding. <laughs> okay, and synthetic data and da retooling too much data yes. creates um, weird things. So think, I never saw the, the demand for data. So, okay, let's take that further then. Okay, yeah. you, you mentioned training. Well, all the top people talk about inference. So I look at this whole thing like when I went to school. Yes. I went to kindergarten, I went to then elementary school, I learned, I was being trained. And then I don't go back to school, I don't go back to fourth grade. Yes. But I'm now out inferring yes. and reasoning off that data. 
And so how do you see customers talking to you about uh, how they're handling the data? Certainly you got to get trained, get the degree, move on to inference and reasoning and reinforced learning. Yeah. We do that as humans. Sure, and, and, and yeah. you know, it's very interesting. There's a number of different school of thoughts. Uh, most of the customers that I'm talking and some of the hyperscalers and technology companies, they come to the realization that it's not done once. You need to constantly be updating the yeah. data. Let me just give you some statistics. You know, every hour in the US, how many businesses change their address. Just make a guess. Hmm. I have no idea. Over, 10, over, over 15,000 companies change their address in the US every hour. Over 200 CC CEOs change in private companies every hour. These are surveys that we've done. Yeah. So not having the right data, not understanding who's the ultimate beneficial ownership, not having fre not be able to fresh that data and train to get the right results is absolutely critical. So. You know, that's my school of thought. You yeah. need fresh data, you need accurate. to be accurate data, fresh data yeah. that is completely be able to yeah. be updated. I mean, the database thinking goes into now to the general business nomenclature. Data cleaning is pop popular, quality of data, uh -huh. data dumps, data latency. What are, the, what are the, some of the first principles that you guys have at, at Dun & Bradstreet? Because, you know, ethics has come up. Yes. Uh, you mentioned data supply chain. Yes. As people use APIs, I don't know what their security posture might be behind that API. Yeah. No one likes to see a black box because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what's in there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so this has become now trust. Yes, and it's all about trust, right? And I, I would say when, when we think about the principles of AI, we put a lot of emphasis on provenance. So really understanding what is the data coming from, coming from ethical providers mm -hmm. that we can trust. Uh, we that is top of mind. Really thinking about integrity and lineage, so that we can go back and in time, mm -hmm. and we keep the whole history to understand what are the changes yeah. and prove that the data is correct to, to every single customer. Um, that's critical. And then, as we think about new use cases and experiment with our customers, we launch um, uh, DMB uh, data labs and. What we're doing is experimenting different use cases in a very safe environment with customers, but again, yeah. understanding what is the outcome that I want to get to depending on the use case. If I'm going to solve a big problem for a CFO, it's going to be very different than what I do for a CRO. Yeah. So really understanding those principles yeah. and integrity is critical. This is where I think Gen AI, you guys see helping accelerate that Correct. kind of matching yes. context. Yes. Take us through the day in the life of your job. Well, first yeah. of all, you're chief revenue officer, but you do more than that. What's yeah. your role? <laughs> what are your uh, tasks at, yeah. at Dun & Bradstreet? What do you work on? Yeah. Strategy? So, so I I do a lot, I, just a little bit of, on, Dun & Bradstreet has gone over the last four years through a major transformation in upscaling the tech stack and the data supply, bringing, expanding the, the data uh, supplier, right? And alternative data. and. Now we're very, very focused right now in go-to-market activities and really bringing to market in a very uh, creative way and added value for our customers, the crown jewel and the yeah. highly differentiated data that we have. So really thinking about partners that we can, that have similar values to ours, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of integrity, trusted brands, to make an impact and solve big, big problems for our customers. So we're very focused on that. You heard a lot about when we met in IBM, right? Um, you know, the partnership that we have with IBM and we just did one of the initial products as procurement to help yeah. uh, procurement professionals. We've done a recent partnership with LSAC for private markets, uh, with ICE, um, you know, with Google to make our, our data easier to be delivered uh, through BigQuery. So we're really thinking strategically, we're at this spot where we want to double down so that our data can be democratized, yeah. right? And knowledge can be democratized. So you're, you're focused on customer go-to-market, go, bringing your data and product portfolio to your end user customer. Correct. And providing services there, as well as expanding the connected ecosystem. Correct. And that requires platform and, and kind of a little bit extra vetting than just doing what you used to call Barney deals. You know, yes. like, I love you, you love me. <laughs> um, but that's different. That's yeah. engineered in, yes. very tightly coupled, Yes. But yet different third party. That's data. That's data. That's data. data providers data or provider. other services. Correct. Okay. Any kind of strategy thinking around um, 
startup integrations, how technology startups could work with you? Yeah, and we do have a partnership uh, channel with around 200 partners. Some of them are really big ones, some of mm. them are smaller, more startups. So we've got a number of very niche players, for example, the, when it comes to supplier chain or when it comes mm. to master data management. So always open to conversations yeah. because I think you have to lean in right in this area of explosion of AI because you can't do it on your do own. Do your customers ask you for, because I could see a customer saying, hey Isabel, I love what you're bringing to me for this value, because, but I don't have the big resources. Can you help me put the solutions together? Yes. Is there like a Dun & Bradstreet like marketplace? Are you matchmaking? So Are you we doing do, services? We do services for matching uh, to ensuring that when customers are using our data, especially in the master data management use case, we're able to connect, yeah. match. One of our biggest customers increased their match rate from 85% to 98%. And actually he was with me in one of the conference that we just yeah. did. But it's, it's, that is really important. It's not just yeah. dropping the data in, but how can I make yeah. sure you are successful with what we're delivering to you. You know, it's interesting, you know, I think like I'm working there, I like, love the opportunity so much, I, I want to go work there with you guys. <laughs> um, I just see so much possibility. One of the things that we're seeing with successful AI companies, Isabel, and I want to get your reaction to this, yes. is that um, professional services businesses are service-based, Yes. and that's humans. Mm -hmm. And so we all know how that scales, body, scale, mm -hmm. it's linear. Uh, there's no exponential scale, like, you know, go big or go home, like the big tech platforms. And so if you were a funded startup in the past and you said, we're going to have a professional services arm, the VCs would say, no, get rid of that yeah. because we want you to build the platform, hit yes. escape velocity, yes. and, or use professional services to prime the pump, get customers and then get rid of it. But now you're seeing professional services really a key part of all the AI successes because um, you can scale professional services with platforms. So the best formers we're seeing right now in some of these AI scenarios, whether it's a startup or professional services company having operating leverage with a platform or platform companies scaling up professional services in a flywheel. Mm. So that it's actually now part of the business model. Yeah. Because it's not a, it's a, it's a multiple step function value on the human yes. in the loop. In yes. this case, a service. What's your reaction to that? Because we're seeing people who have like potential services um, have two kinds of, Wait, two kinds of scenarios. That's not our core business. Yeah. To, oh, we might want to bolt on some professional services to accelerate the platform. And oh, by the way, it's highly profitable because it's not a, it's a not linear scaling. Yeah. It's scaling exponentially with the platform value. Yeah. What's your I, reaction to that? Yeah, I do think because with AI, the aperture has open ups and it's so big, like the potential, we just don't even know what's next and proving out the use case and understanding how the data with the model can solve whatever the next question is and the next problem is, I do think you need that services, professional services component to add that additional value and doing all the testing and you know ensuring mm -hmm. that the hypothesis that you have is gonna yeah. come to realization. Yeah. We, I, I was in a meeting with one of the hyperscalers yesterday where what they're doing is using our data, grounding the, they want to pro, we want to provide, uh, illuminating the supplier chain problem. And what we're doing is bringing customer data with our data, right, and start grounding those use cases and understanding what is the additional value that we're bringing yeah. to the customer. And well, yeah. it's a three party. We've got a consulting company, very well known. We've got the hyperscale and we've got us, right? Yeah. But it's, that collaboration That's your consulting or is that the th another company? That's a third party consultant, okay. but we also have, again, a small group of consulting team helping data right. advisors. So you have services. Data engineers to help with that. So you have that services to kind of yes. create linkages with these key partners. Correct. Okay, so that's a great use case, by the way. I think that, that whole use case of that data sharing, yeah. you're seeing these processes that used to be manual or physical, mm whether it's healthcare, doctor trying to keep notes, now yeah. that's scribed, then healthcare. But the business side, there's all these manual processes that certainly involve paper that goes to the cloud, I get that. But you have an opportunity to wire up. Uh -huh. This ask procurement was a great example that yes. you presented because now think of all the drudgery that goes on and the muck, yes. the toil yes. of like grinding out 
yes. undifferentiated activities. Correct, correct. Because um, completely just, automate that yes, away yes, and make we, it more accurate. Accurate, yeah. We just launched uh, ChatDMB again for our customers to be able to get access to the data, right, in a faster way, right, whatever yeah. you are, a sales professional, supplier, or whatever it is that you wanted to interact our data with. So again, a yeah. lot to come. All right, give me give me a, a feel for your customer conversation because yes. you're, you're talking to the partners, you're talking yes. about the big hyperscalers. Yes. Take us through some some of the best conversations. What are they like? What specific things are going on? What's innovative? Share some innovative conversations you've had yeah, with customers. Yeah, so what it was very interesting, I was with um, a, a hedge fund actually just last week and they've been using up our data for a, a period of time. And they're always like, what else do you have guys that I could use? And we're just incorporating in our data supplier, um, shipping data. And this is the, quant, the head of quant, and he goes, Isabel, did you know that your data, putting shipping data, I can actually correlate as a proxy of the performance of a public, public company firms? I was like, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah. this is, this is that's, that's, that's what I mean, it's new adjacent markets that we're yeah. getting into. Did you say, oh, we have to price that differently now? Yeah, <laughs> and that's because what the, I, I didn't say that yeah. at that time, but I thought, hmm, a well, new package. Well, this is where value of the data comes in. So, you know, my last question, I know you got, you got to run, I really appreciate you coming into the see us here at the Cube East. But we're seeing that, that now that Gen AI is starting to highlight data as intellectual property and value, Yes. in this case, the hedge fund, gets a lot more value because they're doing stuff that they're bringing to the table and better together, mm -hmm. the sum of the parts, is the, the value is greater than the sum of the parts. People are looking at how to differentiate the value, quantifying it, because not all data is created equal and beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, that I might look at data, you might say, it's low. for us it's just basic Dun & Bradstreet data, mm -hmm. but here, I'm like, wow, that's gold. Mm -hmm. So now, is there a usage? How are you guys thinking about this? Because we're seeing in cybersecurity, for instance, yeah. Insurance is just generically basically changing because some data is actually if it gets hacked, no big deal. Mm. But some other data, if it gets hacked, is worth protecting. So even little things like insurance, so it's the quantifying value mm -hmm. of the data is really hard. Yes, it's hard, but I th the way we think about it is really understanding very well what is the use case, who is the customer persona and we do what is the return on investment. And actually we, in many of the conversations with the customers said, this is your problem. Let me tell you, by doing this, we have a calculator. Yeah. Actually said, this is the return on investment. Number of hours you save, right? Number of personnel that you save, and you start adding that value and they can crystallize, you know, how quickly they can get to the outcome that they wanted to. Isabel, thank you so much for coming in to talk with us here thank in theCUBE on NYSE. Great to be here. Final question, give yes. you the final word. What are you most excited about going into next year? Um, and what should people know about Dun & Bradstreet that they might not want, know now that get the kind of the modern story going on yeah, here? Yeah, so uh, look, I'm excited about all the new products that we're going to be bringing to market next year. You heard the, the partnership with uh, ABN. This is just the beginning of a second rollout that we have very, very soon. Uh, so there's many products that are going to be coming to market uh, where we're going to be adding more value. We're expanding and making big bets in private markets, and that's an area where we think we can add a lot of value. Um, and about DMB, I would say we have, in this digital transformation, trusted data, dance that nobody, yeah. nobody has. If you want to be, just one thing, if you want to buy something or put an app in Apple Store, you need to have a dance number. If you want to put an app in Google, you need to have a dance number. We yeah. are a pervasive business identifier yeah. that help master yeah. data and help to solve problems around growth and risk mitigation. And AI loves identifiers because it can reason with it. So yes. the smarter you are with your Dun & Bradstreet data, yes. the better you'll be in digital. Yes. All right, Isabel, thank you thank so you. much. Thanks thank for coming for on. Thank you for having me. Okay, this is theCUBE East. This is our NYSE studio. The Cube is here on the East Coast. You'll see a lot more coverage linking Silicon Valley to Wall Street, wall to wall coverage here on Media Day. Investors, entrepreneurs, and companies that are innovating with data. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.